Right then, welcome back to War Thunder, where today we'll be looking at everyone's favourite torpedo bomber, the Fairy Swordfish Mark I. As usual, I shall be covering the history and technical details first. If you wish to skip all that and go straight to the battle, although I'm not quite sure why you would, go click that time code in the description. For the rest of us intelligent people, sit back, relax and prepare to be blasted with knowledge regarding the Fairy Swordfish Mark I. God damn, why does he take so long to upload these? To begin this story, we must travel way back in time to before the First World War when, in 1912, an officer in the United States Navy, suitably called Bradley A. Fisk, patented the idea of dropping a torpedo from an aeroplane. Although the United States Congress allocated no funds to this idea, several other countries began experimenting with airdrop torpedoes. These included German experiments with torpedoes launched from Zeppelins in 1914, Italian trials in 1913, and Britain launching its first aerial torpedo from a short S-64 seaplane in 1914. Britain was the first country to adopt a dedicated torpedo bomber, in the form of the short Type 184 which first flew in 1915. The first confirmed sinking of a ship using a torpedo dropped from an aircraft occurred on the 12th of August 1915, when Flight Commander Charles Edmonds, piloting a short Type 184, launched a 14-inch torpedo at a Turkish supply ship in the Marmara Sea. The Ferry Aviation Company was founded in 1915 by Charles Richard Ferry and Ernest Goska Tips, who had previously left the Short Brothers. Ferry Aviation began as a subcontractor, building aircraft designed by other companies, but made their name with their first in-house design, the Ferry Campania. This aircraft also has the distinction of being the first aircraft specifically designed to be launched from an aircraft carrier, featuring folding wings and jettisonable wheels on its floats. These operated from one of the first aircraft carriers, the HMS Campania, along with a few more traditional seaplane tenders. In August 1918, Ferry Campaigners took part in one of the first joint air, sea and land operations when they attacked Bolshevik positions on Modyukski Island during the Russian Civil War, operating from HMS Nairana. After the First World War, the Ferry Aviation Company was a leader in naval aircraft design and production, producing such aircraft as the Ferry 3, which was in operation from the end of World War I to the beginning of World War II, primarily as a reconnaissance aircraft, the Ferry Flycatcher Carrier Born Fighter, which was the primary aircraft of its type during the interwar years, and the Ferry Gordon Day Bomber. The Fairy Swordfish began as a private venture by Fairy Aviation to produce a naval reconnaissance aircraft that could also be used as a torpedo bomber. Greece took an interest in the project as they sought to replace their Fairy 3Fs currently in service, and although they eventually lost interest, this caught the attention of the Air Ministry, who issued specification S15-33, which included the role of spotter aircraft to the Fairy design. This role refers to the act of an aircraft observing the fall of shot from warship guns, and radioing back aiming corrections. At this point, the aircraft was named TSR-1, standing for Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance. The TSR-1 first flew on the 21st of Ma uh, March 1933, at the Great West Aerodrome near London. This prototype, designated F-1875, made several test flights to explore the aircraft's capabilities, but was lost during a spin test on the 11th of September. The second prototype, the TSR-2 designated K4190, featured some improvements over the initial prototype, such as a more powerful Bristol Pegasus engine, a lengthened fuselage to reduce the likelihood of an uncontrollable spin, and swept back upper wings. This prototype was used to test float plane configurations and conduct water handling trials, as well as catapult launching tests. After the TSR-2 had been evaluated by the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment at RAF Martlesham Heath, three pre-production aircraft were ordered by the Air Ministry, at which point the aircraft was named Swordfish. 
These featured improved three-bladed propellers over the two-bladed propellers of the initial prototypes. The first 68 Swordfish 1s were delivered for service in July 1936 with the Fleet Air Arm, although the intended replacement of the Fairy Swordfish, the Fairy Albacore, entered service in 1940, Swordfish production continued in full swing to the extent that Blackburn aircraft was called in to produce Swordfishes in order to meet production requirements. Production was also conducted by several smaller factories and workshops, along with most other British wartime manufacturers in order to spread out production facilities in response to bombing by the Luftwaffe. The Swordfish remained in production until the 18th of August 1944, at which point nearly 2,400 had been built in several different marks, including the Mark II, which featured ASV Mark II radar and provisions for carrying 3-inch rockets, and the Mark III, which featured the powerful ASV Mark XI radar. The Fairy Swordfish entered service in July 1936, where it began to replace the Fairy Seal, a version of the Fairy 3F in the Spotter Slash Reconnaissance role, and the Blackburn Baffin in the Torpedo Bomber role. Initially, it competed with the Blackburn Shark for the role of Torpedo Bomber, but the Shark was soon replaced by the Swordfish. On the 1st of September 1939, the Fairy Swordfish equipped 13 squadrons, along with three flights of float-equipped Swordfishes stationed on warships. This number was rapidly increased to 26 squadrons in the following months. The first combat deployment of the Swordfish was in spring 1940 during the Norwegian campaign. On the 11th of April 1940, a flight of Swordfish was launched from the aircraft carrier HMS Furious to attack German ships around Trondheim. Although only two destroyers were there at the time, one hit with a torpedo launch from the attacking aircraft was recorded. On the 13th of April, when HMS Warspite laid waste to most of Germany's destroyer fleet, Swordfish, launched from the British battleship, acted as spotter aircraft. In addition, one of the Swordfish successfully sunk U-64, a German U-boat with bombs. During the Battle of France, the Swordfish was deployed to attack ground targets such as German tank columns, bridges, troop formations and airfields, especially during the Dunkirk evacuation. It was during one of these operations when my great-grandfather, who was flying a Spitfire escorting a flight of Swordfish, succeeded in shooting down a BF-109 Dungeonet. He went missing over gravelines on a similar mission, unfortunately, uh, the uh, next day, I think, when the formation was attacked by BF-110s. Anyway, after the fall of France, Swordfish were dispatched to attack German-held ports along the French, Belgian and Dutch coasts to disrupt the invasion preparations believed to be taking place there. On the 3rd of July 1940, 12 Swordfish were dispatched from HMS Arc Royal to attack the French warships stationed at Oran in French Algeria in order to prevent their capture by German forces. During this attack, the French battleship Dunkirk, along with several other ships in the port, were severely damaged. Perhaps the most famous use of the Swordfish was the Battle of Taranto, where 24 aircraft from HMS Illustrious attacked the core of the Italian Navy docked at the port of Taranto in southern Italy, where, on the 11th of November 1940, they crippled three Italian battleships, two cruisers, two destroyers and several other vessels, using torpedoes and bombs. This attack demonstrated unquestionably the effectiveness of torpedo bombers. Indeed, Japanese envoys studying the British attack on Taranto used information gathered there for their own attack on Pearl Harbor a year later. Swordfish, stationed at Malta, later went on to attack Axis convoys making their way across the Mediterranean to support their troops in North Africa. Another famous deployment of the Swordfish was during the British operation against the German battleship Bismarck which had previously sunk the HMS Hood, and was now roaming about the North Atlantic. On the 26th of May 1941, two flights of Swordfish were launched from HMS Ark Royal. While the first did not manage to find the Bismarck in the deteriorating weather, the second managed to hit the German battleship with two torpedoes. Although the damage was relatively minor, one of the torpedoes damaged the ship's rudder mechanism, jamming it at 12 degrees to port. This caused the Bismarck to circle uncontrollably, allowing the British warships to catch up and sink it. 
However, in February 1942, the shortcomings of the Fairy Swordfish were demonstrated when six aircraft of RAF Coastal Command were launched to intercept the two German battlecruisers, Scharnhorst and Gneisnau, as they made a dash through the English Channel towards Germany. As the Swordfish, led by Lieutenant Commander Eugene Esmond, who had led the attack on the Bismarck, lined up for their attack on the German warships, they were pounced on by a squadron of BF-109s. Despite this, the Swordfish continued their attack, but quickly all six were shot down. Following this disaster, the Fairy Swordfish was withdrawn from the torpedo bomber role, being relegated to anti-submarine duties. In this new role, the Swordfish was still very effective. They carried ASV radar, which allowed them to locate warships and surfaced submarines even at night and through cloud, whereby they would attack with rockets or depth charges, or direct Allied destroyers to the Axis vessel. The Atlantic convoys found them especially useful in this role, employing swordfish from escort carriers and merchant escort carriers to protect the convoy from marauding U-boat packs. Later on in the war, swordfish were also used to hunt German midget submarines using centimetric radar. By 1945, although production had ended the previous year, nine squadrons still operated the type in frontline roles. The Swordfish had been in operation from the first day of the war till the last, even as its intended replacement, the Fairy Albacore, was pulled from duty. Although replaced in the role of torpedo bomber by the Fairy Barracuda, the Swordfish still proved invaluable as an anti-submarine patrol aircraft. In mid-1946, the last squadron operating the Swordfish as a training aircraft was disbanded, and the string bag, as it was lovingly nicknamed by its crews, was finally retired. The Swordfish was operated by the Royal Air Force, the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm, the Royal Australian Air Force and the Royal Canadian Air Force and Navy, who used the Mark IV with an enclosed heated cockpit for operations off the coast of Canada and Greenland. The Netherlands also operated the type and a few examples were captured by the Italians and Spain. Although considered by many to be obsolete even as it was first introduced in 1936, the Swordfish went on to attain a legendary reputation during the Second World War, sinking more Axis tonnage than any other Allied aircraft, was loved by its crews for its reliability and its incredibly forgiving fl flying characteristics, and is rightly placed by many among the great aircraft of World War II. And now it's time to take a little look at the fairy swordfish Mark I in the wonderful world of War Thunder. Hey, I and mean, you thought Po 2 was a sexy aircraft. Alright, so here we have the fairy swordfish here in the uh, the garage here there. Look at it there. Isn't it wonderful? Alright, the swordfish is a single engined carrier borne light torpedo bomber. Uh, by which, of course, I mean it is a torpedo bomber, but it can also be used as a light bomber, as you see here. See, it can carry bombs. But if I go into the modification thing, well, you can carry a torpedo. Alright, uh, it has a crew of three. You get the pilot who sits in the front there. There's where the pilot is. Behind him sits, uh, it says gunner, but that's actually the observer. He looks out over the side of the airplane and observes things. Sometimes uh, he'd be replaced by the fuel by uh, uh, an extra fuel tank in real life. And behind him sits the gunner, who gets to play with a 7.7mm uh, Vickers K machine gun on a flexible mounting. This uh, for this you get uh, 576 rounds in 60 round pan magazines. I think they're pan magazines because they go on top. If they went uh, you know underneath, it'd be a drum magazine. It's not. It's a pan. Because it's pan shaped. Up here in the front you get another 7.7mm Vickers machine gun, except in this case it's the E machine gun. It's the old putt putt type machine gun you get with the Furies. And for that you get 600 rounds of ammunition, as you can see there. In front of him you got a bunch of fuel tanks. You have one big fuel tank here where most of the fuel goes, and I guess this here is an auxiliary fuel tank right behind the instrument panel, so if this catches fire, then he's not going to have a very happy time of it, although it'll probably be warmer, seeing as this aeroplane tended to fly over the North Atlantic a lot, and it got very chilly here in the open cockpit, that's why the Canadians made one with a uh, enclosed cockpit, 
which was probably very sensible. Up here at the front you got the oil reservoir, so you know, it's protected by the uh, fuel tank from behind, but you know, from the sides, up and down, every which way, flak can uh, damage this, especially if you're attacking from the front. So. Uh, if you're attacking, for example, an anti-aircraft gun, the shots will go up, and they'll hit the engine. Uh, more on that later. But they'll also likely hit the oil cooler, and so you'll start leaking oil. And if you're very unlucky, uh, something will catch fire. Here you got the oil radiator. That sticks out the side of the aeroplane right there. See, that's the radiator. Kind of an odd place to put a radiator, but I guess... Fairy engineers are probably smarter than me. Here you got the exhaust pipe. You only got one on one side, and it's attached to this nice bronze engine cowling. Isn't that nice? The engine itself is a 810 horsepower Bristol Pegasus 3 M3 nine-cylinder radial piston engine. It's uh, not particularly powerful. Um, I mean, it's it's adequate for this aeroplane. You'll get around 140 miles per hour out of it. That's around 180 kilometers per hour, possibly. Future me will tell you. He's the one in charge of editing. Uh, anyway, um, ordnance you get here. A Mark 12 torpedo, 18 inch. That'll kill a destroyer. It might kill a uh, light cruiser. It probably won't do much. Uh, probably won't kill a heavy cruiser or a battleship or anything like that. But destroyers, light cruisers, cargo ships, eh, it'll, it'll do. Or you can also carry four GP 250 pound Mark IV bombs in uh, underwing racks. These are pretty effective bombs. They're equivalent to the 100 kilogram bombs that you get with the Russians. So, yeah, they'll kill medium tanks if you hit on target. You'll kill light tanks from uh, any which way. You'll, these are very effective in uh, Grand Forces battles, especially. Right, it is a biplane, and uh, it's very slow. Because it is a biplane, luckily it's not as slow as the Po 2, but uh, it's still pretty slow. You're not going to get away from anything in this. That's for sure. Right, so uh, here we have it on the uh, deck of uh, the uh, mighty HMS Sark Royal, or something like that. It's a British aircraft carrier because it has a metal flight deck. I like the wooden ones of the Japanese and the Americans. Why you would make a warship's landing deck out of wood escapes me, but there you go. Anyway, so uh, yeah, you do get a carrier start, because this is a carrier-borne aircraft. You get a little arrestor hook. We'll uh, get to that when we do the landing. Anyway, so uh, before we take off, we're just going to take a little look at the cockpit. This is easier to do when we're on the ground, because we don't have the droning, loud, super j loud engine, and uh, we don't have to worry about flying while we're looking at the uh, instruments. So, what have we got? Well, in the corner there, you got the uh, the clock. That's useful for navigation, because it'll tell you how long you've been travelling in a particular direction. That right there is... Right, I think... Uh, well, I've looked. Him. I've looked up this uh, instrument panel beforehand before I started this. Unfortunately, that was of a later swordfish. This was the only one I could find. I think that was a Mark III. This is a Mark I, so yeah, the instrument panel is slightly different. I guess more rudimentary. But that red little bar thing, the little graph, that is the oil pressure, I believe. And you've got the fuel pressure indicator, that light comes on if your fuel pressure drops too low. For example, if you're leaking fuel, and, and it's leaking all over the place, well that light will come on and say, hey, there's a problem with your fuel, there's not enough pressure. You've got oil temperature. The nice thing about this aeroplane is that all the, uh, well most of the uh, 
instruments are nicely labeled in a language that people can understand. Because, <laughs> you know, English is the only language in the world. Uh, you got the side slip indicator and the turn indicator. That, that, um, I think that's to do with rudder. Uh, we will uh, evaluate all this once we get up in the air. That there, that is the uh, the, the fuel feed selector. I think so. Normal operation, it takes fuel from both tanks equally. If you select it main only, I guess that. Uh, selects it only from the big giant fuel tank and gravity only um, that uh, gets fuel from the little tank possibly um, yeah you'll be amazed how difficult information is to find about how this aeroplane works these must be the lights so you know, one of these will be landing lights, you got instrument panel lights, you got navigation lights, you got uh, electronics I guess and so another light uh, jettison small bomb containers before bombs so if you're carrying bombs then you got bomb containers you got a jettison before the bombs here you got a uh, uh, instructions Yeah, you got instructions for the inertia starting switch, apparently. Uh, you got the boost indicator, that indicates how much boost you've got. You've got the priming pump, that's where you, prump, you prime the engine by pumping that, and it squirts a little bit of fuel into the engine so you can start it. That there is the oxygen supply. So, you know, you fly in this aeroplane around up in the air, there's not much oxygen up there, so you've got to have your mask on. Unlike goddamn. Philip here has. Put your mask on, Philip. Actually, no, don't, because we haven't taken off yet. Uh, you got the uh, airspeed indicator in knots. You got the compass behind there, that'll be the gyroscope. That uh, tells the direction indicator, or in other words, the compass, which way to point. Uh, you've got the altitude mm, indicator there, that tells you how high up in the air we are. We're currently 200 feet, I guess. Except we're not, because we're 48 feet up. And there you've got the artificial horizon, everyone's favourite instrument. That there is the tachometer, that tells you how quickly the engine's turning. That is a big button, one sec. Okay, according to the source I've been using, that there is the tor torpedo indicator switch. But seeing as the torpedo indicator is that horizontal bar there, I don't see how you switch that on. That there is the clamp that sticks the gun sight on, apparently, except that's the gun sight. You can barely see it past the propeller, because the propeller is the same colour as it there. It's the old classic ring and bead type gun sight, except in this case you don't get a bead. You just get the ring, so you have to guess where your bullets are going, I guess. And we're back to the side slip indicator. Here you got the control column in the traditional British style with the hoop on top of the stick. Next to it, oh well, on top of it is the gun. You press that, the bullets come out. You see? And that one below it must be to drop whatever ordnance you're carrying. And down there at the uh, bottom, the foot pedals, they operate the rudder. See? There you got the rudder turning. Look at it, Philip. No, what was your name? Steve? I can't remember. We'll probably be dead soon. And, yeah, there's the instruments, more or less. You got some other levers and knobs and switches lying about, and oh, I'm dying! Or in other words, we're, we're about to take off. Out there, that has to do something with oxygen supply. And there you've got the starter switch. And you can see, I didn't need to start it, it started itself. Now if Jeffrey's going to let me take off, I'm going to do so right now. Here we go. And whoa, the speed! 
accelerates very quickly off the aircraft carrier, but if we were taking off from the ground, it would accelerate a lot slower. Warzone just does that so that people don't crash into the sea once they take off from an aircraft carrier. As you can see, we're carrying the torpedo armament, the traditional armament of this airplane. And there it is there, we're flying around. You get two little windows down there next to the struts that hold the wings on. I can't see them from inside the cockpit. But there's not really much to see out of them anyway. Maneuverability, it's a biplane, is very maneuverable. However, it is also very slow. Because it is a biplane. Visibility is its not that good, to be perfectly honest. From behind, you got that shield that protects the observer and the gunner, uh, the gunner from being very, very chilly. And you got this big wing here, you got struts everywhere looking ahead. you got to look for a little tunnel through the struts. Put your gun sight there, you can see just how vague that gun sight is. Torpedo guidance indicator, you got little notches on it so you can sort of estimate how quickly the ship you're shooting at is going. That knob there, no idea what it does, neither does the internet. There you can hear the gun, and the uh, the rear gun doesn't get very much room, well, very much uh, of an arc, that's what it's called. There, yeah, that's, that's as far as it goes right. As far as it goes left, down, don't even get down to the tailplane. Add up, not very far at all. And like with most single tailed aircraft, you can't aim it directly backwards, which can get annoying. So yeah, we're travelling around 120 miles per hour. If we got up at a little bit higher, we might be able to go a little bit faster. Hey! That there destroyer, that's surely a German destroyer, right? Don't forget, with British torpedoes, they're rubbish, so you have to slow way down to around 120 miles an hour in order to drop them. It's probably a, it's, it's a reason why this aeroplane is pretty good at torpedo bombing. Because it's so slow, you've got less of a chance of drowning your torpedo. There it goes there. Very slowly. Now let's see if we can't land this thing on the aircraft carrier. It's a very good air uh, aeroplane to uh, learn how to land on carriers with. Because all too often you friggin' see people on, on Navy ma maps where you have to land on an aircraft carrier and everyone's like, Oh, I don't know how to do it. I can't land on that. I've never landed an aeroplane in my life. Now you see the arista hook's coming down. Right, this is a nice slow aeroplane, so it's easy for you to learn how to land on an aircraft carrier with it. I suggest you take the time to do that a couple times before, you know, doing it for real and crashing into other people. There we are. Nice and simple. Just isn't that easy. Check it out. Well, I'm the best, aren't I? Didn't even damage the propeller. Yeah, so, uh, that's a good thing about the swordfish. You can learn how to land on aircraft carriers with it. Right, so there you have the technical details, more or less. I think I covered everything. Um, yep, doesn't look like there's anything else here. No armor. I think I mentioned that. Anyway, let's go take a little battle, don't you think? That's what I think, and that's what I'm gonna do. We don't hit an iceberg. Alright, so the first attempt uh, didn't go particularly well. I get bombed by a ghost aeroplane. I've got no idea where that came from. Luckily, it only did minor damage. It was probably that Dawny Doe 17 up there. So, uh, looking around, and there's an SPG there. I managed to drop two bombs on it. There they go, there. And boom. Isn't that lovely? That turn, looking around still, all the fighters seem to be uh, interested in the other fighters. I managed to drop a second pair of bombs on another 
self-propelled gun. It's probably a uh, NAS horn or a uh, what was I call it? The other one, Hornis. And then we start getting shot at by the ground fire. Luckily, because this aeroplane is mostly made of canvas, shells go right through without exploding. But uh, we do get the nice sound, new sound effects of bullets whizzing past. I do shoot at it a little bit with my turret, don't kill anything. And then as I'm coming in for another pass, there's a Dornier Doe 17 who wants to have a go. Uh, he's the fighter version, I think. That means he's got a 20mm cannon, and there's also a JU-88 joining in on the fun. I take a couple of shots at him, he takes a few shots at me, but at this time, I'm pretty badly damaged. There's leaking oil all over the place, and so I uh, decide I should probably head back to base. Because there's uh, oil all over the windscreen, I can't see where I'm going. Let's look back, because the gunner says he's dead, but it looks fine to me. And then the uh, JU-88 comes back, and he's only got one machine gun in the front, uh, I think. Yeah, but there he, saw, he saws my wing off, and it's just fallen off, and I crash. So well done to him. Second attempt, I'm approaching the, uh, the, the blah, 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 howitzers and trying to do it in first person mode for maximum dramatic effect, but then, oh no, we're attacked from behind by a pesky little biplane. He, he's, he's shooting me, but I've got a cunning plan, you see. And because I'm so slow, he, he has to break off and come round for another pass, but this time I'm ready for him, so I wait for him to begin his second attack run, and I drop my bombs! And uh, he sets me on fire and shoots me down, but oh yes, I killed him with my bombs, and that were marvellous, and I'm so clever. <laughs> But anyway, yeah. So fourth time, you can see me selecting. I'm going to start on the airfield. I tend to start on the airfield with this airplane so that uh, the enemy have a chance to uh, encounter some of our Allied fighters. A bit of an issue with the caps lock there, but never mind. So here I am, rolling along, rolling along the runway. Doesn't take too much to get up in the air, don't need flaps or retractable undercarriage or anything like that. And we're up and we've taken off, here we go. We're gonna go attack some grand targets. Right, so uh, initially I decide, hey, I'm gonna skirt around the outside. I'm gonna fly towards one of our bombing points and then towards the enemy bombing points so that I'm not in the main glom of the enemy fighters, but I decide, nah, screw that. I'm just going to fly straight down the middle. So uh, here we go, turning towards uh, the middle. I think. I mean, that was what was going on in my head at the time, but well, I guess it didn't translate to screen. I can't be remembering this correctly. Oh uh, well. Uh, can't be helped. Uh, so, yes, I'm flying down straight down the middle and down the fighters. Hopefully they won't notice a tiny little swordfish like this. All the same, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves, so we fly as low as possible. Down below treetop level, if, if, if possible. Below the tallest trees, at least. And flying very low to the ground, because not only is that le uh, more likely that you won't be detected, it's also a lot more fun than just flying through the air, because you actually have to avoid stuff. Plus, it's very easy to do in the swordfish, because it's so slow. Not as slow as the uh, Po 2, mind you. Flying over some trucks, I'm sure the dudes in those trucks are like, Whoa, look, it's an antiquated biplane. What's he doing here? And to them I say, ha, huh. truck, yeah, and that showed them all right. Anyway, so uh, we're, we're flying over Bastogny, the town of 
Bastone. The swordfish wasn't used in Bastone, by the way. But I'm sure you all knew that. There we go, flying over the villages. Or townspeople. It's probably a town, actually, isn't it? And like with the Po 2, it does take a while for you to get anywhere in this aeroplane, but at least it can go faster than 80 miles per hour. We can go 140 miles per hour. That's almost twice as fast. And we're flying over the Allied gun emplacements. Yeah, them shooting off at the bad guy convoys. I'm thinking I'm going to make a pass on the howitzers and I tell that idiot hurricane to stop shooting at my ground targets and perhaps shoot at that BF-109 who's chasing him. But never mind. I'm sure there'll be plenty of howitzers left by the time I get there. So yeah, it's making a pass on the howitzers first and then going bombing one of the convoys. Because they've got tanks and I've got bombs. Do you know what that equates to? Hey, stop shooting my howitzer, you idiot. I'm going to take that one, that's mine. I don't care what you get. It's my howitzer. So I'm a ground attack aircraft. What are you? You're a fighter. Go fighting. Yes, I'm still angry at this sort of thing happening. And I shoot back at him with my turret. And the flex starts opening up does get a little bit accurate, but luckily we don't take any damage, as far as I can tell. I do think Flax got a little bit more accurate with the last patch. 1.77. Anyway, so uh, we're going down straight down the spine of the convoy. That's what makes it easiest to aim. And there's a tank moving very slowly. I think it's a Panzer IV. The anti-aircraft guns open up and I drop the bombs just ahead of him and he rolls over them and boom! There we go. I did drop all of them at once because I have a pretty tough time d bombing moving targets. I know, it's not that hard, but then I'm not very good. So there. So I come back and uh, look, there's a, there's a half-track down there. No doubt filled with Nazis. So I shoot it with my single machine gun. And won't you know it, they perforate the armor and kill it. But then I hit a tree with my propeller, because I'm an idiot. So I have to land out in the middle of the field while being shot at by Joymans. There we are, perfect landing of course. Little bounce, but never mind. And still being shot at, but I don't think they can really see me. They're just shooting where they think I am. And there we have it. I decide this battle's good enough. I killed some stuff. I shot some things. No need to do this again because at this time I was getting a little bit bored of flying the swordfish. Right. Get 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 out of your airplane. Go on. There we go. Come on. There we are. And with that, it's back to the hangar. And there you have it, the furry swordfish. It's uh, it's not too bad. I mean, it's slow, and it's relatively easy to shoot down, but you get a decent amount of bombs. You can carry a torpedo on that rare occasion where you're on a uh, sea battle. battle. And uh, yeah, you get uh, forward-facing armament, so you can shoot at ground targets, such as... as uh, you know, artillery pieces and that. And it's got a defensive gun that's, uh, that's adequate, I guess. I mean, it's not going to shoot anything down, really. But then those sorts of guns never really do, do they? So yeah, swordfish. It's good. Try it. And practice how to land on carriers. Uh, like I just did just there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so hopefully you enjoyed this video, and hopefully you'll join us for the next one, where we'll be looking at the Mitsubishi F1M. Yes, I know we're not doing the, uh, the Hago or Igo or whatever it is, the 
Japanese tank next because I had always intended to do the aircraft first and then the tank second, but somehow it got mixed up. But anyway, so yeah, it's a bit here for now. Hopefully, we'll see you then. Goodbye.